So I'm going to introduce um, Hermes now. So Hermes is a senior lecturer in applied mathematics and data modeling in the Department of Engineering Maths. Um, all he wants me to say about him is that he's a normal, regular human. He's going to be talking about <laughs> some weird things. Um, so <laughs> just before we start, I'm going to present Hermes with his Best of Bristol Award, um, just to say congratulations for all the work that he's done. So Fancy. if you'd like to oh my God. come and have your award. <laughs> wow, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, this lecture, in Hermes's words, will attempt to brainwash the audience into thinking the exquisite use of mathematics can change your lives. So um, I guess we'll just see how that goes. So thank Fantastic. you, Hermes. Thank you so much, Amy. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for all the students that um, um, allowed me to be here, for your kindness and generosity. Um, this was really unexpected and a uh, huge, huge um, surprise and of course, very happy indeed to be here. It's not every day that I have the chance to talk to an audience that is spontaneously here. Most of my students, they have to be in the lectures. So I was wondering, did anyone pay you guys to be here today? You came from your own free will, really. Um, so, today we'll be talking about a little bit, <clears throat> um, I'm sure you all very excited about maths and stuff, right? And our journey starts here. This is a baby. <laughs> and it's cute, isn't it? Like, especially when you look from the distance, it's always very cute. Babies are everywhere, literally everywhere. Even you guys weren't being a baby. I was a baby. As a matter of fact, you have about 350,000 people, babies, being born every day. This would be equivalent of almost 400 jumbo jet A380s, completely packed of babies flying around. I know it's a and like useless is that, but anyway. Um, so, the main question is, how do you make a baby? And the question I ask the audience, do you guys know how to make a baby? It's not a rhetoric question. <laughs> do you know how to make a baby? Yes? Well, for those of you that don't, you came to the right place. <laughs> because yes, mathematics, that's how you make a baby. Sorry, I, that, that was the spoiler. But then you ask, why enough a mathematician, you know, start looking at sperm motility? What, you know, what? And, and we, with all honesty, it was an accident. I was back in Brazil, naive student, you know, interviewing for, to come to do a PhD here in England about 10 years ago. And then at the end of my interview, I was asked, so would you be interested on a swimming problem? I work in hydrodynamics. I said, of course. Michael Phelps, dolphins, and things like that. For six months of my life, my friends and everything, I believed that I was coming to England to study swimming. First meeting with my supervisor. So this is the reproductive tract, cervical mucus. I said, what? And of course, that was too late. So basically, my advice is, before you say yes to anything, make sure exactly what you're signing for, because 10 years down the line, it might be a little bit too late. But, but then the whole question becomes, how you know, sperm moves? And this journey actually starts with about 300 years ago with Antonin van Leeuwenhoek. So this guy here was one of the, not the inventor, but one of the perfecter of microscopes. He managed to, to make microscopes and the lenses in a way that you could visualize with a precision that never, uh, that never was achieved before. And basically, he, he came, he made several, uh, observations and he wrote to the Royal Society saying things like, I examined male semen to the best of my abilities. It's an animolecule figure one, which is this figure here, the famous figure, 
uh, uh, which is mostly has the aspects when living and moving, it swims with head of front part in my direction. I find this a little bit weird, like this palm is coming towards him. Um, the tail, which when swimming, it lashes with snake-like movement like eels in water. A very nice poetic description of sperm cells. I'll come back to these in one moment. But he ends his letter saying to your society, yet as I felt averse from making further investigation and still more so from describing them, what I did continue, uh, uh, I did not continue my observations. Pause, dramatic pause. What I investigate is only what, without sinfully defiling myself, remains a residue of the conjugal coitus. So, so he was deeply embarrassed about the fact that he was examining semen. Um, maybe I should be embarrassed to give a whole presentation on that. But I hope to, to convince you of the opposite, that actually we are all talking about mathematics and engineering to a certain perspective. So this is the modern view of a human sperm, what we know today. So you have the genetic payload there, where, is, uh, where the head is, the tail. The tail has several structures like the mitochondria, where the energy source of the cell. Then you have out dense fibers, which are these fibers with numbers that tapers along the tail. And this whole structure is connected together by elastic springs, radial spokes, and a bunch of proteins at the molecular level that holds this piece together. However, they are not just a stiff column. They're flexible. And you basically, um, they, 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 um, how they move is, is all down to molecular motors. So these are molecules that you give energy, and they perform a mechanical work, and they move something in your system. So basically what you have is mo molecules that when attached to nearby filaments, they force the filament to slide against each other. But the sliding is prevented because these elastic linkages, and every time you try to slide, this generates a bending motion. So nature ingeniously came with a solution to have bend in motion by basically having tangential uh, displacements. So this is the, the, the underlying, let's say, biophysics of how sperm moves. Now I want to invite you to when you see these images, to imagine these processes taking place inside each sperm. So you have sperm doing all sorts of things, swimming with friends over there. There's one kind of lonely, where my friend? And there was another one like with a broken neck, another one a little bit higher there. So all sorts of like swimming behavior. And you have 55 millions of them. So how do you make sense of what you see? They seem to be very complex. There you go, the, the guy with the broken neck. <laughs> oh, left again. And, and why we care about this? Because infertility, so you know very well the infertility is rising in our in, in our community for different reasons. Sperm motility is a, is a main cause of infertility, of, of course, because if sperm cannot move, you cannot fertilize an egg, full stop. And this, unfortunately, affects the young population. So in England, for example, 20% of 18 years old uh, population is already classed as super fertile. The number of sperm cells are also decreasing across generation. Grandparents, usually in European setting, Western world, they will have more sperm count than grandchildren. And this trend seems to be following quite uh, uh, in, a strange, in, a, in a strange way. But what I, um, but what I would like to, to mention is that the fact that you can have infertility, so a defective tail, also is equal to defective cilia elsewhere in your body. Cilia is a type of flagellum that other cells will have. For, for example, in your lungs, they will have cilia, um, um, some cells will be ciliated so that they can pump fluid and they can clear your airways. 
In your brain, you need cilia to pump fluid again so that nutrients will flow around. And defective sperm also leads to defective cilia is what we call the ciliopathies. And this is an excess of more than 40 genetic diseases and can be anything from chronic bronchitis, mental retardation, hearing disorder, kidney disorder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when we're talking about infertility, we're talking about this is just the tip of the iceberg. The problem is much bigger. For example, someone that has chronic bronchitis, very likely, if he's a man, will be infertile, just because of the same genetic uh, encoding. And what's the solution? There's not really a solution. It's rather circumvention. You go an IVF treatment or some artificial fertilization. So you're never really curing this person from infertility. You're allowing this, the couple to actually have a baby. So making babies is hard. And this is one of the aspects of our research is actually to bring oxygen to this problem and say, is it possible to help um, infertility and infertility diagnosis, for example, using mathematics and engineering and engineering tools? So this is where we, we start really our journey. And because the sperm has to, of course, swim in a fluid, we need to understand certain properties of the fluid. So before anyone falls asleep, um, I need to introduce two key concepts. You know one, which is inertia. Inertia is your ability to continue in movement if you're already in movement, unless an external force stops you. That's inertia. And then you have something opposing in the fluid, which is friction, viscous friction. So the molecules in the fluid, every time they flow and pass around, they will feel the presence of each other and basically add a drag to the system. These two effects are kind of opposing. And you can calculate this by a ratio. We call this number, it's a very special number for us in fluid mechanics, is Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is literally just the ratio between inertia and friction, viscous friction. So for example, when the Reynolds number is very high here, is, is the world we live in, basically dominated by inertia. This is what would happen with you know, your cup of tea and milk and things like that. Or if you're in a swimming pool. But suddenly, if you reduce the Reynolds number, you can see that the inertia effects becomes less and less prevalent to the point that you only have friction in the system. Any movement you try to do, is completely dumped because of the viscosity. It's a very sticky environment, basically like this. And so it happens that sperm cells, they live in the small Reynolds number regime, and let's say babies in a swimming pool, very high Reynolds number. So far, this is the only thing I need to introduce. And this is a very cool number because in terms of the Reynolds number, being very close to zero, it's not just because the sperm is very small. You can have a low Reynolds number if your dimensions are very big, but your velocity, your characteristic velocity is very small. This is a glacial flow. In a glacial flow, it takes about two years to advance one meter, two meters. So actually a glacial flow is closer to a sperm cell than us just because of scaling and maths and engineering things. You can also do the same thing, and if you increase the viscosity, and that's easier, or in the case of sperm cells, is literally the size, L there. The length of a sperm is about 50 micrometers. So if you touch your hair breath, and you imagine half of that, that's the size of a sperm cell. So whenever you're in the pub and you want to wonder, what's the size of sperm? Just touch your hair. Yeah? You, know, you never know. You never know these days. So Newton doesn't work. Viscosity dominates. So accelerations force, so force proportional to mass times acceleration doesn't happen here. Forces are proportional to, visco uh, to velocity. 
because this is now overdumped regime. And the consequence of that is tremendous because if you, if you now double the velocity, you're actually also doubling the force and vice versa. So you have a, a linear relationship between these, these, these objects. But what is more astonishing is that because you live in this low inertia regime, inertia-less regime, every perturbance in the flow of the fluid is like a magnetic field that is being formed in the fluid. So these are experiments which shows how the trajectory of beads will flow if a sperm is beating. And they look like basically needles of, of a magnet. So one sperm is swimming here, and even if the guy has a broken neck here, and they're coming together, they're interacting from very far because of their, not magnetic field, but their velocity field that is already interacting them. So mathematically, it's very beautiful. Um, and one of the really cool consequences is that in low Reynolds number regime, you can travel in time. It's true. You can. So this experiment was done by a very famous mathematician, uh, G.I. Taylor. This is his finger there. And basically, he put a bucket of glycerol with a die on it. And he decided to turn the handle. And every time you turn the handle, the outer walls will rotate with the handle about four times. So let's see what is going to happen. So he goes there, and of course the die starts to disappear. Second time, third time, fourth time. Stop, it's not there. And then you turn back, and suddenly something really weird, but at the same time magical, the die reappears. So you literally can, can, can go back in time. And the equations tells you that. But I promise not to show any equation. But believe me, this is there. And you say, OK, very well. That's a very nice trick. But you know, what's, what's the impact? Does this have any impact on, on, on sperm cells? Why do we care about that? Well, if you have a flapper like this, a robot like this, that in, in high Reynolds number, you're doing this, you can swim just fine. But then, if you are in a sticky environment, you don't go anywhere. So something like this that just goes back and forth, what is happening in reality is you, you go down, you actually advance, but when you go up, you're actually reversing your forces. So you're trapped in time. You have to go back. There is no inertia to help you. So a simple movement like this cannot propel fluid and cannot lead to locomotion at micro scale, which is crazy. Because for us, this is one of the simplest ways to move anything, right? And guess what? Traveling waves are not time reversible. So traveling waves are magical mathematical objects that break this time, uh, uh, this time constraint. It's a mathematical constraint that you have to break. And as a result, you have a variety of microorganisms that actually exploit the fact you have traveling waves propagating down the tail to propel fluid or to achieve locomotion and achieve biological function. And this is an understanding we have now that we couldn't have before, for example, through you know, understanding the equations that govern the fluid mechanics. So we need basically three ingredients to get the sperm moving. You need fluid mechanics, you need elasticity, and you need some kind of internal activity that will lead you to this motion. These are the three pillars that we need to get motion. I promise no equations. So, 
This is how one of the simplest ways you can encode this, where you have fluid mechanics, elasticity, and, uh, uh, and internal forces working together. You can solve these equations in a computer and create your virtual sperm. And this is one of the solutions. You can generate low budget animations and, uh, and try to you know, get people really excited about this. But although these, yeah, I'll stop there because it's not really interesting. But it's still, this thing swims, right? And as a tool, as a mathematical tool, you can start using this to then ask questions and test hypotheses that you not necessarily would be able to in experiments. For example, when you go to tropical places, sea urchins, they have to reproduce in seawater. So basically they release sperm um, in seawater and they have to find the egg in the open environment. The funny thing is, if you put sea ur urchin uh, sperm in high viscosity, they develop this kind of buckling stabilities and they cannot move anywhere or they start moving in circles. But this is weird because if you compare with human sperm, in the same viscosity, you don't get it. So there's something that the human sperm has that the sea urchin doesn't that makes this possible. And we analyze that to go down to the structure. So the, actually the engineering structure of the tail of the human sperm is reinforced when compared to the sea urchin. The sea urchin only has the inner core that it, we call this axonym. And for human sperm, you have the axonym, the inner core, together with a bunch of other structures. So the conclusion was, well, these additional structures came about or the human sperm evolved in such a way that these additional structures reinforce the tail in the regions of the tail where compression, high levels of compression is expected and you would get a buckling instability otherwise. And this is just playing with the theory. And, and then we go back to the experiments because in fertility clinics, this is not used. High viscosity is not used to select sperm. And what we want now to check is, how about if we start selecting sperm with high viscosity? Because then we actually make sure that this is you're selecting for the best cells. But at the same time, this is kind of obvious because sperm has to navigate to the cervical mucus anyway. So we'll be basically mimicking nature. But now with an understanding of what this actually uh, entails. So, and then you can also use mathematics in an inverse manner. You can do the experiments, track how, the, the, how this motion is taking place. So this is now something, um, this is a real human sperm, and you can see that the motion is much more complex and elaborate. Different frequencies are playing a role there. The, trajectories, the trajectory of the head is also very complex. But because we know how things move in, 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 in low Reynolds number, in fluid mechanics, you can get these shapes and you start calculating what is the velocity field look like around this sperm. And this is the funny thing, because as a mathematical device, I'll just, I'll, I'll just put another, another uh, equation here, but, don't, but never mind. As a mathematical device, you can decompose this complex fluid flow into a set of analytical solutions, so just mathematical formulas that we can get with, that allows you to listen to the sperm. So if you never heard a sperm cell, now is the chance. I'll try. Uh, it's very mild, but this is the beat of a human sperm. Nice, like a, it's like a, a Brazilian carnival block, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, too much of this gives you, you know, gives you a headache. 
But what I'm trying to convince you is that from something that is just an image, look how much we can actually drill through, that how much information is there for you to find. And there is more. And you can use mathematics as, as an X-ray machine, like a theoretical X-ray machine. Why? We know that Newton told us that all the forces have to balance. So fluids, elasticity, and the internal motors, they all have to balance to give you motion. And typically, you have this. You can see the experiment. So this is your solution. You know how to compute fluid mechanics. And you know a little bit about the elasticity of objects, engineering, things like that. So what is the question mark is exactly where what we can't measure in an experiment. And you literally do a, you invert this matrix, not this matrix, uh, this, this equation. So basically, the internal motors will be equal to the fluid forces minus elasticity. And this gives you, for the first time, measurement of what the molecular motors are doing at the molecular scale as the sperm moves. No other equipment in biology can go that deep in a structure. Remember, we're talking about something that is 50, 50 micrometers, so your hair, breath, half, half that. And then what we discover is that the molecular motors are being very clever. They are sending these traveling waves of uh, contractions that are very nicely coordinated and synchronized. With this information, then we can calculate things like the energy consumption or even the efficiency of a given sperm and whether this is actually a given sperm is likely or not to fertilize an egg. So look how deep we can go with that combination of theory and experiments. So again, about 300 years ago, Christian Huygens, which actually discovered these when he was recovering from illness. Um, bad joke for this moment. Um, he had loads of time to look at clocks. And basically, uh, what he saw is that if you put two pendulum clocks in a wooden wall, they will start to synchronize. Because they share information through the structure, which is the wall. And what you see in these metronomes is exactly what is happening with sperm cells. Each part of the sperm, each section, these molecular motors are actually working as a pendulum. But they are not alone. They are like glued together because of the structure. So the flagellum structure gives you a medium by which these clocks can synchronize. So actually, after all, we are not looking at the sperm. We're looking at coupling of many clocks. And we solved this problem many years ago. So what you see here is a salmon sperm. It's very rare for you to see a sperm waking up. And you can do these experiments with, uh, with salmon sperm. And basically, you can see how quickly it goes from straight position, straight configuration, to something that is wiggly like that. And the way that we're studying this process is actually by coupling clocks, ultimately. But what I find more fascinating is that all this is actually related to Alan Turing. So I'm sure you, you all came across Alan Turing at some point in, 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 in your life, I think, uh, as a very famous mathematician, especially after the, the game, the game, the imitation game movie, and, um, and became really famous for being one of the inventors of the computer or how you compute things. So the Turing machine, for example. But actually, what Turing is more famous for among the mathematicians is not that. It's because of that. All these patterns there, they are what we call Turing patterns. 
They are a result of reaction, chemical reactions that take place and are mediated by diffusion, motion of the molecules. So 1952, during um, just two years before he died, um, he, he basically published this paper. He was not, he actually jokes in the, in the manuscript saying that this is potentially not even right. But he, he basically started the whole field. If you have diffusion and chemical reactions, you have patterns. And these patterns are behind why you have five fingers, one head, or for example, zebra has these stripes. All down to Turing patterns, because during embryogenesis, morphogenes are these chemicals that will carry the information of what each part of the embryo will become what. But all goes down to chemical reactions and diffusion. But then you ask, well, what's the relation with sperm cells? Well, what you see, this movement, is actually a Turing pattern, but a very special Turing pattern. It's a mechanical Turing pattern. We're talking about diffusion, not diffusion of molecules, but diffusion of bending. When you bend one structure and you release the structure, this structure in the fluid wants to, to homogenize and diffuse this curvature. This is the diffusion we're talking about. And the molecules that are contracting are the chemical reactions. You put these two things together, you generate patterns. Beautiful. Everything is connected. And then you say, OK, you, you brought all the answers. You, you seem to know a, a lot, right? It turns out the sperm is really annoying. Seriously. <laughs> um, when you see this, what I see, and I always seen this, and I saw this many times, <laughs> uh, is the tail goes back and forth, back and forth like this. Very much like Anthony van Leeuwenhoek described, you know, 300 years ago. Yeah? So, in collaboration with uh, uh, a scientist in Mexico, we managed to, um, to track the sperm tail in three dimensions for the first time. Not just looking at the plane, but looking how the tail actually moves in the whole space. Set up very complicated, but then what this showed is that the sperm is beating in a more complicated manner. It's occupying a lot of volume space around it as it swims. But so far, so it was, was okay, you know, his sperm is, you know, uh, is moving in 3D. The problem is that this is, if you look at this sperm from a fixed point of reference, and then you decide, well, I want to see this, this beat, the real beat of this sperm. Then you have to move in the same frame of reference as this sperm. So his sperm is moving here, and I try to catch and see, and this is this picture here, if you move with the sperm. But this is still quite not good enough because you can see the sperm is rotating around. So that, that's not the true frame of reference you can see the, the, mo the motion. To see this motion, then you have to move and row with the sperm. <laughs> Crazy, but you can't do this. And this is the result. So the sperm is going straight, but it's only beating to one side. And it was never symmetric. And I wish I could go back in time and talk with Anthony. March 18, we're not too far from, from uh, March 13. But we've been 300 years wrong about that. And this is a basic feature of the sperm cell. How does the sperm move? And we always look at this and we see the symmetry. The sperm is going back, left and right, left and right. And um, so this is clearly going to have a big impact. When I was in Mexico, that was quite funny. I have a joke. 
you supposed to laugh, okay? So when I was in Mexico, then Mission Impossible was like in the hype. So oh, I went to Mission Impossible. I saw these. I said, my God, I have to come back and record it. So Tom Cruise didn't give me any rights to record that. So you have to stop the cameras, everything like that. Uh, otherwise, he's going to complain. Uh, but I'm just going to play that. So, you know, beautiful hair, everything in the middle of the office. Trying to find gracias. He also speaks Spanish. He's about to jump. What are you waiting for? I'm jumping out of window. What do you mean you're jumping out of window? And. Oh, sorry, I had it in 2D. There you go. So it sounds like my my entire career and and how we always appro yeah, approach this problem was very much a jumping out of the window because we were always looking at the 2D problem. But actually, the 3D configuration is much more complex. So what's the future of that? The future is that I hope to con convince you that the computer analysis systems that are existing that they don't work. And the future, the future is to create a robotics firm. That's a joke. But also, <laughs> but also true. And I have a prototype here. We're trying to make it very close to reality. Um, but a part of having fun on how to you know, take the, these ideas between you know, how sperm moves to actually create robots, which this is actually a genuine project. Um, um, we want to then be able to move these to mobile technologies, for example, where you could do this level of sperm analysis with, the, you know, with, with your mobile phones or anything like that. So you can democratize a little bit this technology. And this is just really the beginning because every single aspect that I mentioned to you here, we could use, for example, and we are using, to understand cancer modeling, to understand how different species, uh, especially endangered species of fish, are able to fertilize or not in, in open waters. Infections like trypanosomes, which is endemic in Brazil and, and gives the sleepness uh, or leishmaniasis, or even like uh, antibiotic uh, resistant tests, which you can basically use similar aspects of mathematics to actually get better predictions. And, and the hope is that at some point, we will not only be able to help humans, but also you know, save the pandas in, in, and, and have this warm feeling inside. Uh, you know, we love the pandas and everything. Um, but also, I have something special to say, which is, after all these years of studying mathematics and trying to figure out how to make a baby, I finally did it. <laughs> so this is uh, my, you know, our project. <laughs> uh, I already know how to speak Portuguese. And he's saying thank you, everyone, for, for coming and for, for being such a wonderful audience and for the patients as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I recognize some students, um, many, everywhere. Do you guys have questions or worries or criticism? Why, why you, you mentioned, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, you, you mentioned earlier on that, um, that sperm counts were, were dropping across generations and 50% in the last 50 years? That's yeah, massive. On, but, yeah. Why? Yeah, well, that's a good question. That's the question that I think everyone wants to answer. I don't, uh, we, nobody knows. But it's highly, uh, this can be highly connected with our way of life. So stress, alcohol, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, diets and things like that. So, but this is not 
the whole, the whole thing either, because if you look to different countries, for example, in, in Brazil, this is not happening. The, you know, the, the, the birth rate is very much increasing. Um, so, so it really depends on which society you're talking about and how they, and how they live in, in, in several. Um, but yeah, this is a, a question that is, is very difficult to answer, I think. Sorry. There. Um, y chromosomes are a lot lighter than X chromosomes, so sperm carrying them should be able to swim faster. Faster, yeah. So why don't we have lots more boys than girls? Yeah, um, is is bigger, but the problem is that to have an effect on motility is uh, is still very small. You could have an effect if you could augment a little bit the gravity that this sperm feels, it. but in the micro scale, given all the diff, you know the different forces that are acting in the system, this level of a difference is still very much. Uh, impossible to, to screen. So what people try to do is to do chemical tests. But then when you do chemical tests, you destroy the sperm. So is, 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 uh, and these tests, they also tend to be very expensive as well. Um, but having said that, in collaboration with uh, you know, scientists in Mexico, we actually put in the sperm to swim in a huge centrifuge to, to test basically sperm in space. No, uh, it's to test uh, microgravity augmentation in, in how it changes motility to try to see if, if we can do that. But yeah, but we had some more here. Yeah. I got really difficult questions, you guys. First of all, congratulations. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, you talk a lot about sperm. To create this, there was the egg as well. Do you have any modeling or... Um, anything to say about the relationship between the sperm and the egg? This isn't a passive. Of course, yes, yes. And uh, and uh, it didn't it didn't come across in my in my in my presentation, unfortunately. But the sperm is very much a, a passive entity in the sense that the reproductive tract is the agent that is actively selecting sperm cells. So in at at, the, at every uh, part. Of, of the reproductive tract, there is something different that happens that the sperm has to coordinate in a different way so that they can find the egg. And for example, experiments that we are doing at the moment tries to replicate the reproductive tract in microfluidic chips so that we can better select sperm using you know, uh, what we know from nature, for example. But you're absolutely right. For example, the sperm cells, when um, they can only fertilize after capacitation. Capacitation is something that can only happen um, in, in the fallopian tube when you have the right types of uh, uh, chemicals that are, that are released by the, the, the reproductive tract. So, uh, so basically there is an active agent that is doing this selection. And sperm cells are basically moving on that environment, basically, but yeah. Very difficult questions. It's getting worse and worse. Hi, um, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I wanted to know how you managed to model the sperm in 3D to find out that they moved asymmetrically. So, so this was based on experiments. And the experiments, we tracked the, the cell in 3D. So we have the solution of the shape. And we knew the shape in time and space. And basically, the only thing we had to do was to use transformations of of references, uh, of lab of, of, of references. So basically moving from a, a fixed frame of reference to a moving frame of reference. Very much like uh, the kind of things that, you know, Einstein had to do to come with uh, the, um, uh, um, the relativity theory. So it's all playing with what it happens if your system, if you change the point of view and you, you change your reference frame. And you're starting, to, you're starting from the perspective that the shape should be the same. And this is like an invariant in your system. But we also do numerical simulations of that. So you get the shape, 
then you put this shape in a computer where you solve at every point in this space how the fluid is going to move according to this movement. And these are difficult uh, uh, mathematical things to achieve as well. So this is, this is like a two streets, uh, two very different streets. Um, I was just wondering if, do they all swim in the sort of like, are they all like say right-handed or are they like left-handed and right-handed sperm when they swim? Like do they all go the same way around? Well, we, <laughs> so difficult guys. I'm so proud as well, you know. Yes, um, very difficult. So our data shows that they always tend to have a uh, left-handed symmetry. So there are helixes that go left-handed, so like that. Um, however, that's not the whole story because there are other people that managed to find sperm that could have a, um, a huge variety of rolling directions. And we suspect that rolling motion is actually, uh, is actually um, uh, very important for the regulation of when the sperm swims in high viscosity medium. One thing that it didn't say is that this 3D motion that you're seeing is for a sperm that is moving in low viscosity. When you put a human sperm in high viscosity, then this motion completely changes. And this 3D motion becomes 2D motion and is left and right, left and right. And there is a level of, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, transfer of the rolling motion in one case to the symmetric 2D motion to the other case that we suspect, but we, we don't know yet. So maybe next year, if you ask me the same question, I will be able to answer. It's the fun thing about uh, uh, science, right? Because um, I started with, you know, I started with this thinking that everything was symmetric. Then I found this year that is asymmetric. Everything I've done in the past is wrong. <laughs> and then I said, well, great. Um, great that I'm not retiring now, but it's, it's a little bit annoying, right? Like, anyway. Uh, so I know, I know you said there was no definitive answer as to why sperm counts have dropped so much in the last 50 years, but do you think, how likely do you think it is that a similar trend will be shown in the coming generations? In current, uh, yeah. in the next generations? Yeah. My God. <laughs> uh, I'm a little bit scared. Because I came, I came from a generation back in Brazil that I start, for example, I start drinking, uh, you know, normal amounts of alcohol when I was 26, 27 years old, and and I'm 37 now, and people, oh my God, you look so, you know, like oh your skin and everything. <laughs> I say, I say, well, you know, for, for a good decades of my young version of me, I, I, I didn't do, so, but this is not the trend in, in, I'm not trying to say anything like, <laughs> really difficult question, man. Like, so I think you, you guys, young generations, you, you have to take a little bit, uh, you know, reduce a little bit the, 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 the foot from your accelerator because um, now things are getting more delayed. You guys are having uh, you know, by the time you, you, you have a job and you want, you know, and find someone and this will be, again, my age and, and this tends to be a problematic age. So, and, you know, the things that will happen in your entire life will define this moment. So, so I would say what everybody would say, which is try to keep healthy and, and not exag take exaggerated uh, measures of, of anything, really. Uh, because I don't think this is going to change, to be honest. Um, and IVF treatment is extremely expensive. It's extremely expensive. It's, it's, getting, uh, it's getting to a point that only, only, uh, only the very rich will be able to do it. And, um, and how you can circumvent that, I think is having a very healthy lifestyle. It can help, definitely can help, of course, because everything is connected. For example, 
uh, in terms of uh, uh, oxi ox oxidative stress. You already came across oxidative stress. So a sperm that ha is under a lot of oxidative stress, oxidative stress is basically you have a lot of uh, uh, oxy oxygen radicals running in your body for some reason, maybe because you have a lot of stress or, or something like that. But then if they enter the sperm, there's no really problem with, with the tail because if you go to IVF, you can, you can fix that. But then this causes fragmentations in the, in the DNA. But that's okay because then the magic egg is amazing because sperm is always very wonky and the egg has an amazing property which is to fix the wonky sperm. And the younger the egg is, this fixing ability is higher. And, and that's why, you, you know. So, um, so I say, yeah, don't, don't drink too much and things like that. <laughs> Let's move the topics. <laughs> yeah? Hi. Um, have you noticed any flagella movement changes based on chemotaxis or chemo attractants? So human sperm uh, will be attracted to progesterone, um, but many, many, uh, many scientists actually debate against that, you know, in favor or against that. Um, ultimately, yes, uh, sperm has the capacity to basically, if there is, if there are, let's say, a chemical landscape here, it will sniff this chemical and regulate the motion in order to find the chemical or the maximum of this chemical. So sperm cells are very good as a optim for, for the mathematicians and engineers for optimizing, so to find the maximum of a landscape, finding the maximum of your function, especially external fertilizers. So we're doing experiments with uh, ovarian fluid. You take from, from the fish, you, put, you release ov ovarian fluid, and you put sperm nearby, and sperm is able to find this in less than uh, in very few seconds. For external fertilizers, this is cr critical because fish sperm dies after two minutes. Tragic. And you have to find the egg, which is about, you know, few millimeters, in, in this time before you die. So sperm being able to identify chemicals and find where is the maximum in the landscape is they are basically the best, I think, uh, computer in nature because they find the landscape, but you don't know what, you only can measure locally. And also the fluid is always moving like crazy. So they are, they are so, um, so ad like adapted for this. And I should remind you that we all evolved from external fertilizers. External fertilizers. We evolved from external fertilizers to internal fertilizers. So now in internal fertilizers, basically you have, everything is kind of safer and you can put these chemicals and you can have certainty that the fluid is not going to wash away. Uh, but yes, sperm cells and the ability to find chemical landscape is critical for, for both fertility and also as a way for you to measure whether a particular sample is is able or not to fertilize the egg. Thank you, Hermie. <laughs> I think you deserve another round of applause. Okay, yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>